In this video we will be doing an overview of sequences and infinite series. So we'll start off by defining a sequence and an infinite series. Now you shouldn't need much help or review as to what a sequence is. A sequence is just a list of ordered numbers like 1, 2, 3, etc. is a sequence. An infinite series is a sum of numbers. So 1 plus 2 plus 3, etc. would be an infinite series. It's just a series where you're adding all the numbers. And they use summation notation for that. Uh, more on that later. So to find the limit of a sequence, it's finding the limit at infinity, which you've done a million times in Calc 1, and you find the limit at infinity to find the point of convergence. And that would be if there actually is a limit. So if there is a limit, it converges. And to find the limit of an infinite series, which is the 1 plus 2 plus 3, etc., there is a whole slew of complex techniques like geometric series and a, lots of awful tests that we'll get to in future videos. So here are some examples of sequences. Each number in a sequence is called a term, and that's just some verbiage. Whether you're required to know that or not is like knowing what an integer is. It really doesn't matter to solve the problems. So a sequence is defined with an implicit formula. And now this takes some getting used to and lots of practice. Um, it gives the first term and how to find the other terms. So for instance, your first term would be defined as a1. Your second term would be a sub 2, a sub 3, etc. You will have a, a sub n plus 1 equals a to the n. And so if you have an a1, one and you want to find your a2 it would just be a n which is your previous term plus one and then that would give you a sub two for n one two three and this piece here n the verbiage for that is called an index so for this sequence of one four seven ten thirteen your a1 is defined as one and here is your implicit formula on how to find the next term of the sequence so you would just plug in your previous term here to get the next one. So for instance, if n equals 1 and you're given a1 equals 1, you would just plug in your a1 into here. So your a1 is 1, and then 1 plus 3 is 4. And that is defined as your a2. So then to find a3, you would plug your a2 back in here. So if your a2 is 4, 4 plus 3 is 7, and so on. Then you get your 10, 13, 16, etc. Now if you want the hundredth term of a sequence, you have to use a different technique called an implicit formula. So if you look at the pattern for this sequence, you'll see that it's 1 pl plus 3 times n minus 1. So if your n is 1, n minus 1 is going to be 0. a2 would be 1 plus 3 times 1, which would be 3 plus 1, which is 4, and then your 6 plus 1, which is 7. So it'll have a pattern that looks like this. 1 plus 3 times n minus 1. And if you distribute out, you end up with 3n minus 2. And that's called an implicit formula. You use those to find the nth term. So if you wanted to find the hundredth term, you would just plug 100 in here. So 3 times 100 minus 2 is 298. Pretty simple, straightforward. So to review, a sequence is an ordered set of integers, and it can be defined with an implicit formula or an explicit formula. And they don't equal each other, but you will be using both of them on the same sequences in infinite series. Now, convergence versus divergence. This is a pretty simple concept, and you'll probably remember it from your limits. If an output of a sequence as n approaches infinity, that's infinity, pardon my inability to draw, is a specific number, then it has a limit, and we call this converging. So if you remember your calc 1 class, and you would have a graph or something like that, and there would be a point here and a point here, it would, if, if it has a set answer at one specific point, it converges. And if it goes on forever, it diverges, which means it doesn't have an actual limit. So infinite series are done in summation notation, and we'll have other videos on that. So 
So in Infinite Series, yeah, summation notation, it will always look like this. It'll be in this form with your sigma with an infinity over it. k equals 1 times a to the k. So this concept builds on previous concepts that you've probably heard before, like that door paradox, where if you have a door and you are approaching that door, which is this distance, if you walk half that distance and then half that distance and then half that distance and half that distance, you'll never actually exit the door. So k equals 1 it, whoops, is what that means. So if you look at it in terms of a box, if you have a box and you take half that box, then you take half that box and then half this box and half that box and half of there and half of there. Uh, it equals one, but you're taking an infinitely smaller piece. Yeah, more on that later in future chapters. Um, infinite series, such as the, with the summation notation, will, can also converge or diverge. So let's take a look at some problems now that you have a background. So here is your first term. And in section 9.1, so give the first four terms of the following sequence. So here you would just plug in your n. So if n equals 0, then you would have 1 over 0 plus 2, and that's going to equal 1 half, and that is your a sub 0. And you would just keep going on that pattern. So your a sub 1 would be 1 over 1 plus 2, and that's going to be 1 third and there you go, that's your a sub 1. Pretty simple. You can see that it's just a pattern 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Moving on to number 2. Let's see what we got here. Now, number 2 is pretty tricky and time consuming. It's just wrong. It uses a recursion formula, and a recursion formula calculates the term of a sequence using the term before it. So for your a1, it actually defines it right here as a1 equals 6, so you don't really need to do any calculation for that. So to find a2, you would slip in your a1, so your n is going to equal 1 for a2, which is sort of counterintuitive, but because it's a recursion formula, you slip in the one f the previous term. So for your a2, your n equals 1. So that would be your negative 1, 1, minus 1, and then you slip in your a1, which is times your 6 fifths. So when you plug that in, you're going to get 6 fifths. And you keep going for the other terms. So your a3, you're actually going to plug in your a2, and then your n is going to be 2. So to find your a3, it's going to be negative 1, 2, minus 1, times, and then you have to plug in your a2 over 5, like it shows right here. So your a2 is going to be 6 fifths over 5, and that's going to give you the negative 6 25ths as your final answer. So just be really careful when you're doing these, and remember that you have to plug in your previous term. So for every a, your n is going to be one smaller for this n right here, and then for your a to the n over 5, you're going to slip in that number to find that number according to this formula. And it's kind of tricky, you'll get it. Now here's your first look at an infinite series. Now your partial sum for s sub 1 is going to be 1 ninth, and you don't have anything to add that to, so that would just be 1 over 1 plus 8, which is going to give you your 1 ninth equals. So to find your s2, you're going to add that to your s1. So if your s1 is 1 ninth, then your s2 is going to be 1 over 2 plus 8, which is going to be 1 ninth plus 1 tenth, which is going to give you the 19 over 90. And for S3, you're just going to do that again. You're going to take your 19, 90, 19 over 90, and then add it to your S3 of the 1 of 3 
plus 8. And you can put it into your calculator like this if you're not that imaginative. Um, or you can just do it in your head if you're really, really good at fractions. And you just keep adding your previous term to the last term to get the next one. So here's number 4. And you can see for this one that this just wants the next exponent of 4. And for here, you can just plug in your n equals 1. So you would have your 1 plus 4 squared for your a1, right? Because your a1, you would plug n in for 1. So 1 plus 1 would be your 1 over 4 squared. And that's going to be your 1 16th. And then for your a2 would be your 4, 2 plus 1 which would be your 3, which would be 1 over 64, and so on. Pretty self-evident on that one. Now, your number 5 is also pretty straightforward, just plug and chug. So your a1, I'm going to get an equal sign there, is going to be your 2 times 1 minus 1 over 1 squared plus 1. So you have 2 times 1, which is 2, minus 1 is 1. Then your 1 squared plus 1 is equal to 2, so you have your 1 half. Then you would just replace this guy right here and this guy right here with the number 2 to get 3 fifths, and then the number 3 to get 1 half again. That's just my problem. You'll have a different one. Number 6. This one is another recurrence relation, so remember that you have to plug in your previous term for that one. So your a1 is already defined as 6. You don't need to do any calculations from there, just plug it right in. So for your a2, you're going to plug your a1 in there. So we have to remember that your n is going to be a different number than it is in another series. So your a2 is going to look like this, where you'll have your a2, so that's going to be 3 times your a1 plus 20. So that's going to be 3 times 6 plus 20, and that's going to give you 38. And you would do the same thing for your a3, only you would plug in your a2 here to get your a3, and then you'll get your 134 and your 422. That's how I got one. Moving on to number 7. You can see here that these numbers are just going up by a power. So the next two would just be the next power of 6 from here. So it's 1 over 1776. And then the next power up from that would be 46,656. So to find the recurrence relation, you'll see it's giving that the sequence notation, the recurrence relation, is the same as the implicit formula. And it's rather counterintuitive, but you can see 1 6 times a to the end for a0 equals 1 kind of actually does make sense. Since this is going up by a power, you're actually just multiplying this number here by 6, which is the same as multiplying your previous term by 1 6. So if you have 1 6 as your term, you multiply that by 1 6, and then you get the 1 36. That doesn't look like a 1 6 at all. So kind of makes sense. You just takes a second to think about it. And the explicit formula, as we said earlier, is just this bottom 6, as you can see, is raising up a power. So it would just be 1 6 to the n, and then the n goes up a power. And that, you'll probably see this as the explicit formula first, before you see the implicit formula. This one is counterintuitive. It's just a different way of thinking about a sequence. Moving on to number 8. So for number 8, give several terms of a sequence, complete 8 to A through C. So find the next two terms of the sequence. If you look here, you'll see that it's 9, negative 9, 9, negative 9, 9. And if you don't see the pattern on there, you need help. This should be the least of your worries if you don't see the pattern there. Um, so there you go, negative 9 and 9. Find a recurrence relation that generates the sequence. Now, th this again with the recurrence relations and implicit formulas aren't always intuitive, but here is your answer, part B. Now that sort of makes sense, because if you plug in your a1 to get a2, you're getting a negative 9. And then if you plug in your a2 to get a3, you get a positive 9 if you use this one, because it's negative a to the n. So if you plug in a negative and then you plug in negative 9, you end up with a positive 9. And then if you plug in 
yeah, you see what I mean. So this is the only one that actually makes sense. And for the explicit formula, you'll probably notice this is just 9 times negative 1 to the n plus 1 because the, whoops, negative 1, because the exponent on here, depending on it being odd or even, is going to determine if your 9 is going to be negative or positive. So this is probably immediately obvious. Well, it was to me. Uh, your brain probably works differently. It's just advice. Do whatever you want. Well, that's how you do it. Moving on to number 9. Now this one is more intuitive. If uh, it wants you to make a conjecture about it converging or diverging, and if it does converge, find the actual limit. Whoops. I'm not sure how this keeps coming up out of here. So for that, you see 7 to the n minus 5. So your a1 is going to be 7 to the first minus 5, which is 7 minus 5, which is 2. So there you go. Then you just raise that power up. So your 7 squared minus 5 is 44. Your 7 cubed minus 5 is 338. Your 7 to the fourth minus 5 is 2,396. And you'll see that the number just keeps going up, that there's no real pattern in the answers here. These numbers are just going up and up and up, and they'll just get infinitely larger. So that diverges. There is no specific number that it goes to as n approaches infinity. It's true for all numbers. And for number 10. Number 10 is similar to 9, only this one actually does converge at 0. You'll see that when you're plugging in your n's, for instance, your a1 is going to equal 1 third. When you plug it in, you'll have your... I just did it in my calculator. But if you plug your 1 in there, it'll be negative 1 squared over 8 minus 5, which gives you your 1 third. So 8 minus 5 is 3. And if you don't know that, then you have much bigger problems to worry about than calculus. And you'll see that these answers here, the sign alternates, and the fraction just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But there's no like pattern, like there's no like how we had before in number nine, how we had four, and then the bigger and bigger numbers as we went on. So you can see the number keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller as you go, and that the sign is changing. So that's just an indication that it's not going to diverge, that it's going to converge. And since the numbers are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, intuitively you can tell that it's going to converge at zero. So there's your tutorial for 9.1. Hope it was helpful. If you have any questions, shoot me an email, rate, comment, subscribe.